All right, welcome everybody. Home Studio Basics to kick off the 12 voiceover gifts of Christmas. Uh, very exciting day today, obviously, with the launch of the 12 voiceover gifts of Christmas contest and uh, so many amazing prizes to be given away. $14,000 in counting for the prizes for the 12 voiceover gifts of Christmas, which is absolutely, completely, and utterly insane uh, because I, I know the number is probably going to get higher before the contest comes up, but one of the ways that we are kicking off here officially is with this free webinar, which Uncle Roy has so graciously agreed to do. So we've got our Santa hats, he's got his jingle bells, and we are ready to go with Home Studio Basics. Um, I wanted to say we, we've we got a bunch of stuff that we're going to work through. If you do have a question that comes up that is relevant to specifically what we're talking about at the time, if you can just put a Q beside your comment, a large capital Q, that will help it to stand out in the comments. But uh, just scrolling through, welcome Cindy, Cam, Briscoe, Janice, Susan, Guy, Ron, Luke, Lisa, Peter, Tim, Jenna. We got a lot of people on right now, 56 and, and counting. And so uh, wow. welcome, Uncle Roy. Thank you for uh, agreeing to do this. Yeah, it's one of the gifts. This is one of the gifts. Now, uh, we, we should also point out, um, you're also going to offer two 60 minute consultations. Those are for two individual winners. So two 60 minute consultations that people can use for uh, talking demos, talking home studios, talking DAW or whatever I'm assuming. You're also going to do one of your two hour life changing sessions, which truly that's exactly what it is. A two hour life changing session that you can use to have Uncle Roy set up your uh, Adobe Audition, your Audacity, your Twisted Wave, uh, which if you've never done it, you should just do it and make your life so much easier. And then somebody is also going to win a killer new telephony demo because the prizes just keep coming. Wow. If you want access to all of those, though, you do have to sign up for the 12 voiceover gifts of Christmas, and you can do that at markscottcoaching.com forward slash 12 bo gifts. But Without further ado, uh, let's get started with the webinar because I know that we've got a lot of information that we've got to get to. So we're going to move over to the first question here after, for the webinar. After I'm, after I'm done with this, Terry is having his two hour. There you go. So he's going to learn some stuff here and then he's going to learn even more after we get yeah, done. Yeah. So here's the first question. Besides budget, what factors impact mic purchase decisions? Or should it say besides budget and peer pressure <laughs> well i was going to say peer pressure should not be one of your deciding oh you have to have a 103 Whew. you don't have to have a 103 you don't have to have an 87 yes you do tell the if truth. you have thirty five hundred dollars <laughs> us then you should have an, an, an 87 if you have that kind of budget um part of it depends on your space because if you've got a shotgun mic not my favorite but if you've got a 416 it's going to be more forgiving of your uh environment uh you know because it rejects rear and side um sounds so that's the 416 but that's also that's shotgun in particular right it doesn't just have right. to be the 416 that's, but the shotgun in general shotgun is, is har hypercardioid so right the bad thing is it has a slightly tighter pattern, so the sweet spot is a little smaller. Uh, it travels well, as you know, that's your travel mic, but yes. it's also, you like it to match uh, your home studio. That's another factor is what, uh, if you're traveling, you don't want to be traveling with an 87, probably. Uh, I don't think need... it would work well in a hotel room at the Hilton Atlanta airport in March with airplanes <laughs> taking off every 12 seconds. I can just see the pillow forts now. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but with, but with a shotgun mic or an Apogee or something else. Uh, so travel is one consideration. What your home studio uh, environment is like is another one. Um, the other thing is, if you're going to put it up on your website, you can't put I've got a USB AT2020 on your website. Nobody's going to take you seriously. So some of the peer pressure as well, you know, you're going to put Put Neumann 103 on your website and everybody will take you seriously. Now put Neumann 102 on your website instead and save the money and we can all go out for lobster. There is something to be said for that too, right? That, you know, you, you, you want to believe that nobody's ever going to judge a book by its cover, but there is a certain perception that comes with certain microphones. And I think it's also worth noting though, that not everybody that looks at your website is going to have any clues specifically about microphones, but 
production companies or you know client, cat, the, 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 your basic client your end user client doesn't care they're not gonna as, know but yeah if you sent it in and it sounds great to them uh that's the bottom line of that but yeah you can't put certain mics you can't put on your website as list of equipment you know what they don't care about what headphones you have they probably don't care what interface you have but microphone wise so your environment your tra- your if you're traveling with something uh, uh industry exposure um and a lot of emails went out when 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 pandemic hit you know, the two criteria were you have to have Source Connect and you have to have a Neumann 103. That's ridiculous. Yeah, there was a list that was going around of like agent approved microphones and everybody was panicking if they didn't have one. But that brings up another point. Let's let's quickly address because a lot of people do go out and get USB microphones and USB microphones for people who are, you know, a, a starter a starter microphone that fits in the budget. Um, many will remember I had my lovely little HyperX Quadcast S that was, you know, part of my YouTube live streams for a long time. That was a USB microphone. And there's a reason why it's been replaced with this Rodecaster Pro because, you know, it was fun, but it wasn't great sounding. But let's talk briefly about USB versus I guess like a dynamic like this Roadcaster or the Shure SMB7, I think is a really popular one, versus a shotgun, versus what kind of microphone are we getting into with the 102s, the 103s, the U87s and that? All right. Dynamic mics are great for podcasting. They're great for radio. Not great for voiceover. Not an industry standard. Um, so your, your 7Bs, I'm not a fan. If you if you have it and you really insist on using it, you need a cloud lifter because dynamic mics have a very low output. Condenser mics like the 102, the uh, Rode NT1, uh, not the 1A, um, and the 416, they're all uh, condenser mics. They need phantom power. They need 48 volt that comes from your interface. So unfortunately, along with getting a microphone, an XLR microphone, not a USB, then you also need an interface to go with it because something has to power the mic. Yes. And then it's the mic preamp and in a USB mic, it's all kind of built in. And so it's convenient, but the sound quality is not necessarily what we want. Uh, And if you're going to put it out there or take pictures of yourself with it. Uh, It's not going to be, you know, even if you do take a picture with it, please don't have it that the back of the mic is facing your face (laughs) because you'll really look like an idiot. Make make sure you're using it properly. Here's an interesting question. This one from uh, AJB voice actor. I have an AT2020. It is not the USB. Is it okay? No, it's under a hundred bucks. The AT2020 is the lowest mic that you can buy okay. uh, send me a sample i mean if it sounds okay if it's not broken i will tell you it's not broken it's fine you okay. may need some serious dsing because the s's might be loud it might be bright and sibilant and some people think oh brighter is better well as we get older brighter is better because you can't hear the highs and so bright <laughs> brighter makes you happy because hey i can hear i can hear right? those signals again i can hear i can hear how crisp so um so I I know it's uh, AT twenty twenty is not a- AT twenty thirty five is okay AT forty forty seven is okay, but the twenty twenty you know you have to spend you have to spend at least two hundred and fifty to three hundred dollars for a for an entry level decent microphone. So the Rode NT one is about two sixty five or something like that. It's with the shock mount. It's with the pop filter. And then you need an interface, but the AT2020 uh, is not. Send me a sample. All right, here's another one from Kyle. Thoughts on the TLM49? Ooh. I heard some tests on that. I mean, the original 49 is a very expensive tube mic from back in the day. Now they've they've recreated it, and it sounded pretty darn good to me. All of those Neumann mics, 47s, 48s, 49s, 80s, they, they were not designed for voiceover. Right. They were designed to capture music. So uh, if you can afford a 40, not 49, you know what? The, the, the reissue of the 49 is not all that expensive. 
I I approve. Okay. And go, go on YouTube and listen to the, the yeah, okay. <laughs> this one comes up a lot, so let's address it. This will be the last question we answer on specifically on microphones for now, but difference between the NT1 and the NT1A because it does come up a lot. $30 is the difference and pay the extra money and don't get the 1A. If you have the 1A, oh well. The 1A, if you look at the frequency response curve, you know, the high end just goes it just goes up and off the chart. So it's very bright and very sibilant and will get you into trouble. Uh, the DSer will be working very, uh, very hard to keep that under control. So not a fan of the 1A. I know some people who have it defend it because they have it and they like the brightness and all that. Okay, but when you, if you're on Source Connect and they hear your S's as loud as I think they're going to hear them, uh, that's not going to be a good thing. But ideally, though, I mean, just to sum up, basically, we're, we're looking for large diaphragm condenser microphones versus looking for dynamics and things of that nature. And yeah. obviously, you have to consider budget, but you do want to try to get the best microphone that you can afford within your budget. It's not that I'm not a fan of dynamic mics, but just not yep. for voiceover. Not for voiceover. Yep. Sennheiser 421 is a great large diaphragm dynamic mic if you put a cloud lifter on it because right. you can crank up the input to your scarlet or, or steinberg or, or ssl2 whatever you can crank that up but you're really bringing up uh the noise of the microphone you're looking for level that's just not there right all right let's go on to the second question what are some mic placement best practices do we really want to get right in on it like this then do you fall in love with your voice like this <laughs> uh, <laughs> radio people like yourself are very used to being. I hang my head in shame. That's okay. <laughs> we love you anyway. It's so uh, true, though. They're they're really used to being on mic and hearing themselves in headphones. I mean, that kind of segues into should we be wearing headphones or not? Uh, radio people like can't can't live without hearing themselves in headphones. It's very um, true. Mike, hence the reason them. I have these in ears in right now. <laughs> See that? Because now he can hear himself. And, and I haven't been on the air in 10 years and I still can't help it. See that? So look, my plosives go this way. My microphone is over here on the side. So I don't turn to the mic. I don't play to the mic. You, If you think your job is to talk into a microphone, it's not. Let the microphone find you. Let the microphone do the work. Right on. So... That's every time I get a sample and it's loaded with plosives, I said, okay, you're working the mic too close. So yeah, you can do pinky to thumb. That's right, the this kind way, of the yeah, right. standard, you know, yeah. but off at a 30 to 45 degree angle uh, would be preferable. Okay. You could try overhead like this. I was going to so say what closer. mic up, mic down. Does it like, you see that yeah. often with the 416, right? The 416 coming down. It'll be like this, but then don't lift your head to, try to talk into because it so in your headphones you go oh look it sounds more present all right well there's enough presence in the 416 you don't have to talk into it uh but plosives and what's called mic proximity which is just working just working the mice too close I, I mean if you have an intimate thing and you want to lean in a little bit that's fine but just don't talk directly into it you you guys are making me crazy fixing your plosives this is a really interesting question from Kim. It says there aren't as many shootouts with women, you know, mic shootouts, get a chance to get on, talk into it or whatever. Um, I'd like to hear a shootout with women testing for a good mic for sibilance. I know my strong S is hit around nine to 10 kilohertz. So uh, is there a microphone or microphones that you recommend more so than, than others, depending on vocal type? Like, uh, like I've heard some people say that the 416 isn't necessarily a great mic for certain female voices, you know, like it, does it matter at the end of the day or does every voice have to test a microphone to see what your voice sounds like on it, whether it's male, female, whatever. I think every voice in every space and every type of VO genre that you're doing, because promo is a different thing. And if you're on a 416 and the 416 or any shotgun is known as an in your face microphone. Okay. Uh, so that's fine. But I, I don't have a specific, oh, the 102 is good for women. I've heard all those kinds of stories. I don't believe it. Because if, if, if you hire me or another tech, we're going to tweak your EQ to make 
your voice sound full and uh so yes the mic comes into play but we're gonna we're gonna play with the sound later anyway you know somebody said oh i want to record flat like god intended well god didn't invent microphones and (laughs) interfaces and adobe audition god didn't do that so there's uh, it's great to think that you're a purist there goes goes, (laughs) special guest Dottie pearl snake eyes um you know it's great to try and be a purist which later we'll talk about raw because you know some people say oh no oh oh we only take raw well you'll when we get to that we'll talk about it so bottom line on mic placement really is don't eat it offside or you know slightly so you're not coming straight onto it and when all else fails send uncle roy a sample and he'll tell you if you need to move is that basically what we how we summarize that one <laughs> yeah i mean part, part of that also then you in your environment you better have everything treated including the desk you may have to angle your monitor so that we don't get a bounce from the monitor from the ceiling i'm sure we're going to get into all of that later home studio acoustics but um, there, I, there is no, I don't think there's any formula. I'm sure if you go on YouTube and type in, you know, microphones good for females or something, something will come up. Right. But, so I don't, I don't know that there's a shootout specifically for, we're all equal, men and women, we're all equal in the microphone arena. Since we're talking about that, one of the things, and I know you've talked about this before when I've had you on the podcast, is finding a local studio equipment center like whatever like a sweet water which is online but finding a you know maybe a local version that rents out studio equipment maybe you could go in and you could rent several microphones bring them home try them in your space listen to them record yourself on them see which one you actually decide is the the right one for you or whatever and that can be a really good way to go about it before you go out and spend all the money on it i think maybe the other thing would be if you have some other colleagues that have a, a similar vocal yeah. style or vocal range, you know, ask them what they're using, listen to what they sound like, and and that could potentially be another way to go about it as well. If or, I mean, often at like VO Atlanta, they'll have a, a shootout opportunities, right? Yeah, the Sennheiser Neumann will be there. And <laughs> we had that at Mavo, and Patrick Kirshner went crazy when he got to that 87. You know what he thought. <laughs> So he's on the hunt for an, for a Neumann U87. I understand. Uh, Everybody wants one. This is okay. Here's here's one more question. So we're talking mic placement and possibly changing out microphones. This is a question from Lisa. When I get a new mic, do I need to set up a new session with you to change settings in my editing chain? Because when you do life changing Adobe sessions or Audacity, whatever, you're you're setting everything up to their current sound, their current equipment. So do do equipment changes require? Does a new microphone require new settings potentially? Well. I would re- I would ask for a new sample, mm-hmm. and if the old settings work, then then we're done. Okay. But uh, if you know if if suddenly the new mic is brighter, more sibilant, then we have to tweak the EQ and the deesser. Um, so just send me the sample. Evaluating the samples are free. Right. What what we have to do after that, we'll talk about it. Right on. Yeah. All right. We just want to take a moment to say welcome. There's like, uh, what, we got 112 people watching right now. So welcome to Monique, me? to Brad, to Eric, uh, Christina, Roxanne is watching, Jenna, lots of people. Thank you guys so much for, for watching, for tuning in. Hopefully you're going to learn some things as we work through here. Let's move on to the next question. How do we properly treat our spaces? This is one that drives me crazy because more often than not, when you see somebody with their home studio, they've got floor to ceiling Oralex, like just every possible square inch of the studio covered is that actually necessary or are there things that we need to do it couldn't hurt to cover everything i've i've yet to hear a studio that's too dead we really want it dead we really don't want your voice hitting the ceiling the ceiling is not your friend so you may have to put a cloud over your head or a packing blanket with giant home depot clamps to keep it over and rethink your lighting because you're going to wind up cutting out your light. Um, your desk needs to be covered. It's just another hard surface. You, like I said before, you may have to adjust the angle of your monitor. So a- as many hard surfaces as you see, do you need to cover every surface? I don't know. When I hear your sample, I'll tell you, do I still hear the room? If you're doing a PVC frame with packing blankets, 
that's probably enough. But if you're in a, a, a whisper room or a bear cave, a silent booth, or, you know, uh, you need treatment in there. Right on. Like it's I look hard, in hard. my booth is a, you know, it's a custom built booth. I, I built the walls thick. I insulated it with Roxel, you know, did all those things. It's carpet on the floor. I do have a couple of cloud panels hanging from the ceiling. There's one big panel behind me and then there's a, a bunch of actual acoustic panels in, in front of me, but the, the sides, there's nothing on them. But the one thing that you told me, because I consulted you before I built the booth was put in an angled wall and that angled wall made a big difference as well. So is that something that we need to be thinking about if you're going to custom design a space or if you have the opportunity to build a booth at home? Are there any considerations we need to be thinking about? Yeah, we, we don't want parallel because that's the slap. That goes back, you back and forth. forth. Yep. Your voice is going to hit and go back and forth. Uh, all the rock saw and all that stuff. So the, the misconception, um, you know that the rock saw and all that, that's soundproofing. Mm -hmm. That keeps sound out. That yep. does not sound pretty inside. The carpeting, yes. The cloud over your head, yes, that's going to make it. We want it as quiet as possible, including if you have to have a window insert. They have that Indo company, Indo windows. Uh, if you got HVAC outside your window, or if you've got uh, traffic going on, so it's almost impossible to do soundproofing. Sound treatment is what we're talking about. Make that space sound dead. Make it sound nice. And I think it's important to note, too, and this is something that I've learned because I've been looking at my booth is treated. My office space, which is a very large area, is not treated, and it you know has a little bit of echo to it. And I've been looking at things that I could do to put panels in, and, and not all insulation is created equal when it comes to controlling sound, absorbing sound, right? And that's where... Uh, you know, you can't necessarily just go to the local, you know, to go to Walmart and buy one of those mattress topper things or, you know, like the eggshell type mattress topper things and expect that that's going to solve all your problems. Because there are certain materials that work better based on that. And you don't build acoustic panels out of Roxel insulation, for example, because some people do. Some people do, but not not necessarily what you're looking for. This is a really interesting question. This one comes from uh, Big B. I'm not handy. I have no walk-in closet. I'm wondering about cheaper alternatives to full vocal booths. Like, could I buy a portable sauna or a new shed and do something inside? Can't do PVC and blankets, need something solid. I actually like the idea of a sauna that was duplicate purpose, right? So after the session is done, crank that bad boy up, take your shirt off, sit there in your shorts, relax, sweat it out after a, after a good session. I actually like the idea of that. I've never thought of doing something like that before. That's a really interesting concept. So what are your what are your thoughts on that? I can't remember. Somebody had a sauna that they were going to turn into a vocal booth. I don't remember who that was. But again, is it a hard? If it's wood, that might be okay. That kind of live. Right. My rec room, I used to like to record. It was a big room, but it sounded nice. So as long as it sounds good. Um, you would. I don't know that I would run out and buy a sauna and, and say, oh, here's my voice booth or a shed if you're going to do a shed well, then why not do a booth it's probably this similar price part of it i guess would depend on where you're at too right there's a difference between putting up a shed in you know behind your home in in the country versus on a you know busy street in a busy city or whatever and that makes a difference too so you got to take those things into consideration but it is an interesting idea because i mean look you can buy sheds for a lot less than you can buy a whisper room or a, a studio brick so it's a it's an interesting thing to think about but you still have to treat it the still same gotta way treat it. yeah yeah because a, a shed is going to be what plastic walls you know like yeah it depends on what you shed. buy i guess but yeah here's yes. another interesting question what about base traps how important are base traps to the overall treatment of the space it depends or you know everything all the answers here are it depends uh <laughs> Is you is you do you have a big boomy voice and that the bass builds up in the booth like traditionally corners or where the bass builds up that's why you put the bass traps in the corner if if it's not broken don't fix it don't just run out and buy bass traps because you heard on YouTube that that's what you do you bass traps yep uh send me a, send me a file so it could be bass traps it could be taking the bottom out of your EQ. Uh, so bass traps can be important if you have a problem, if, if, if the bass builds up, if you have, if you're Val Kelly, you won't need bass traps because she has a high voice and she doesn't have those, those low frequencies. Issue, right? If you're Dave Fenoy, you might need, bass you might need traps. a little different story. Oh, yeah. I don't know. 
<laughs> All right, we touched on angled walls. Here's a question about angled walls. If I have an angled wall, should I be facing toward or away from the angled wall? It's under the stairs and the wall is opposite the door. So does that matter? Is it just having it in the space is enough to just control the way the sound bounces around? Or does it make a difference if you face towards it or away from it? Uh, see, if, it were, if we were talking about windows and which way to face, I would say, okay, face the window so that the microphone... The back of the microphone is rejecting. Right. So I would say you have to try it. Try try facing the wall. Send me a sample. Try with your back to the wall and send me a sample. Sounds like back to the wall might be the way to go so that the sound is out in the open. Right. Whereas if it's the walls in front of you, it's going to hit the wall and come back. Right. If that, if that angled wall is in front of you and treated, it's probably fine. Here's another one. We're talking PVC booths. You mentioned those as a possibility. Is it worth covering the PVC? So you buy a bunch of pool noodles from the dollar store or Walmart and wrap them almost like insulating insulating your water pipes or something like that. Is is that necessary? Or with the moving blankets that are outside of the PVC, are you, you pretty much covered? I would say uh, go to vocalboothtogo.com and buy the producer's choice blankets. Or if you can't afford that, then go to Home Depot, buy, you know, Buy twice as many blankets as you would. No, I, I don't. I don't know about covering covering the PVC because um, I don't. There's. I don't think there's any bounce of your voice off of the PVC uh, frame. It's an interesting point that you make about the moving blankets, though. Not all moving blankets are created equal, right? It's not just there, there's a difference between like the producer's choice blankets and a, just a, a standard moving blanket that you would get for wrapping your furniture or whatever. Talk to us Same a little bit with- about that. Same thing with foam. You got you mentioned, you know, those pillow toppers, you know, they, they might only be an inch thick and that's not enough. The sound is going to go through the inch and then come back a little bit, whereas two inches, three inches, whatever you can afford. I don't think there's much of a of a I, I you know, I over treated my space. Right. Two inches, I would say, is minimum on foam. And. <laughs> send me a sample I send me a sample this is the uh, this came from the comments send me a file this is the answer to every question and i love it antland prods at aol.com send me shamefully, a file let me listen to it shamefully not sorry hey you yeah. know what sometimes it's the easiest way and i think you know which does bring up another point by the way like if you're going to be asking questions about your sound it you can go ahead and you can post the question in a Facebook group, for example, and you'll get a hundred different answers from a hundred different voice actors. But if you really want to get the right answers, you just go straight to the professional, go straight to the source. So, you know, listen to the man and, and send him a file sample and that will be, uh, you'll be able to get your answers to know whether or not you are doing the right thing. So that's a little bit of talking about how to, how to treat your space and some of the things that you want to take into consideration there, when you're treating your you space. You know, I'm not, I'm not the only uh, guy in town, but sure but for this podcast, I am, but uh, there's me, there's George, there's Dan, there's Dan, there's Jordan, you know, outside of that. And maybe, uh, I, I don't know about Booth Junkie, if he would evaluate space, but uh, he's, you know, he's a good one to follow on YouTube. So he's testing out microphones and gear. So this that's is good. a, This is an interesting comment from Lisa. As an allergy sufferer, I'll mention that moving blankets may cause issues for some. So I guess it depends Mm -hmm. entirely on what they're stuffed with or made with, but definitely something that you you want to take into consideration before you go out and spend a whole bunch of money on them. Launder it before you put it up. (laughs) Yeah, that's probably a good idea too. All right, let's move on to the next question. Does the DAW that we use matter? We've got Adobe. We've got Twisted Wave. We've got Audacity. We've got... What sound forge Pre- and Reaper, garage band and uh, there's just too many. Um, so bottom line, a wave is a wave is a wave is a wave. Yep. And an MP3 is an MP3 is an MP3. So these are the DAWs, which is digital audio workstation or software, because uh, Audacity is not a DAW; it's software. They just capture sound functionality wise it makes a difference so if you use twisted wave there's as far as i know there's no multi-track so if you're trying to add music to it can't do it in that 
I'm not a fan of Reaper because to do the simplest things, like if I want to raise the volume of a, a syllable, I think you have to segment it, put volume envelopes on it, and then do it. Whereas in Ad uh, Adobe, you highlight it, you push some buttons that I program for you, and, you, and you're done. And maybe there's a way to do that in Reaper. I'm not a Reaper uh, fan or uh, expert. Audacity is great. It's free. But certain things of it make me insane. <laughs> if I forget to highlight, it yells at me. So when I when I teach my Adobe class, I, I start by saying, so listen, it's not, you don't have to highlight. Just push this button. Don't select all. It's not, you know, I'm just trying to cut down. I try to cut down on uh, keystrokes, you know, single keystrokes. Yep. And yep. It, 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 so it depends on how flexible the uh, digital audio workstation or software is. I can put shortcuts in Twisted Wave and Audacity and Adobe Audition. But Adobe Audition, the one major thing that Adobe Audition has, it has a thing called auto heal. So after you've run yeah. your isotope and you've got all your mouth clicks out and there's still a click, you can see it in the spectral view. You don't have to go outside into isotope uh, desktop to go fix it. You fix it right in Adobe. You just highlight it, press the, press the H or Q button for auto heal. Some people have it the A button. Um, and it just, it fixes. And then I make my plosive filter. And there's just a lot more functionality and features and flexibility and more ways to be creative in Adobe, <clears throat> in my opinion, than Audacity. Finally, you can bring your RX, you can bring your isotope, it, the, the new uh, Audacity, you can do that now. And Twisted Wave, yes, you can do it too. If you're doing audiobooks, again, I, I still think Adobe Audition is the fastest way to be pasting in room tone and, and you know, shortcuts and everything. I oh. can say as an Adobe user that Spectral View and Auto Heal changed my life. Like that literally got me back hours of my week every single week and how much more efficient it made me in my editing so that alone made it worth it for me obviously you know you get the tax right off because I, i'm old enough to remember when adobe audition was cool at it and i'm also old enough to remember when you could buy adobe audition and you didn't have to pay an annual subscription to adobe audition but you, anyway you, yeah. Yeah, I, I've been using it since it was Cool Edit 96. And for 400 bucks, you had everything. And it's too yep. bad. But the world has gone subscription crazy. Everything is subscription. Same yep. thing with Word. Same thing with, you know, almost all yep. of the subscription. Yeah, it would be nice if they offered, hey, sell it to us for 1000 bucks, and we'll be happy. That's, you know. Yep. I don't know. Nora understands I swear I pay that Adobe fee for auto heal alone, which I think probably if, if a bunch of us were being honest, there's a bunch of us that would probably say that same thing. So $22 a month the US and it's a write off. Yep. That's not going to break the bank. If you're yep. booking, yep. what's what's $22 a month? You know, yep. that's. And like you said, at the end of the day, a da is a da is a da in that they all do the same thing. They record your voice in the same way. Basically, what you're talking about, I guess the primary difference is just the features and functionalities and, and you know, ultimately what you decide that you need to use. But, yeah, I don't want this to turn into a commercial for Adobe because they're not paying me for it. But, oh, you know, not, oh, my not goodness. Me either. Yeah. I love Adobe Audition. I love Auto Heal. I love Spectral View. I love everything <laughs> about it. All right, let's move on. Uh, we did, I see at one point we had 123 on the broadcast, which is absolutely crazy. Thank you wow. guys for watching. Yeah, I hope that you're nice. learning some things and picking we up some tips. We, we lost, lost a few people. people. Yeah, but that's all right. They'll be back. I'm sure people coming and yeah. going, but uh, we want to thank you guys for watching and trying to get to some of your questions. We'll try to make sure that we get through all of the main content as well. Uh, let's, oh, Mark's pushing buttons that he's Mark's not supposed to be his, pushing. Yeah, he's not supposed to be pushing that button. His, oh, all right, let's move over here. What, if any, basic processing should we be doing on audio files before we deliver them? This is a really good question because I think when we're talking about recording auditions that we're sending out to agents, potentially auditions that we are doing for online casting sites or whatever, how much should we or should we not be doing to those files? Once again, it depends. No. Um, it's going to segue into the next question too, which is about raw audio. Uh, 
you should at least be using a high pass filter to get that noise floor down. If you've got low rumble in your space, if you have a spectral view, you can see it. You run that high pass filter, which in Adobe is called kill the mic rumble for a reason. Uh, and you'll see in the spectral view, if it's set up the right way where you can see down to a hundred, uh, you'll see that all go away. So if you're sending out a file, you can also set this up in multi-track and use that to go out to source connect so that they don't hear your crappy noise floor, you know? So at least, so two things, you want, if you want, really want to get this down to two steps, high pass filter and uh, normalize to minus three. Okay. And then send it. And then send it. So we're not doing a ton of stuff. And I think that's something that we we sometimes make the mistake of. I know that was something that I was making a mistake of in my early days. And, and part of the reason why, admittedly, I came from a radio background. I was used to doing production in radio. Lots of stuff gets overproduced in radio. You know, you got to compress and blah, blah, blah. And right. And so I wasn't really thinking anything other than, oh, this is what I've always done. So let me just keep doing all of this. And, and so I was definitely over processing and I go back now it's funny I can go back and listen to some of those files that I recorded you know 2008 9 10 11 12 or whatever you know before I before I met you and before I knew better and I'm like oh my gosh how did I ever book with some of this stuff what was probably I probably sounded you know, I was good on the radio stuff. though yeah it probably sounded fantastic on the like radio on the but car, the car stereo the nice thing about this too is when it comes to uh processing for particularly in auditions right we want to try to be as expedient as we can with auditions particularly online casting and so if you're not having to take a lot of time to do a lot of stuff then that helps but uh you you, you mentioned that this brings us to uh what, what the next question coming up was which before was to, we get, before we get to that though what, what i teach in my two hour well, you know what we'll, we'll get to the two hour life yep. changing thing we do process we do some eq as needed we do some dsing as needed we do a little compression, but not crazy, which mm -hmm. this is going to segue to the raw thing. Um, the reason they're asking for raw, they had a bad experience or their boss told them. We Somebody like me over-processed the audio and sent it. <laughs> so if you call up the compressor in Adobe and scroll down, you'll see voiceover and it's god awful. Right. Because my settings are artistically tasteful. That's part got to be part of my new branding, you know. Um, so it's it, or they put a hard limiter on it and and they went crazy or, you know, they, yep. they're listening in their headphones and they yep. put a lot of stuff on or they have or they're using the plugins that came with their with their interface that they don't need or they bought a manly box because they heard that on uh, and Dave Fenoy use it, but nobody set them up properly. So right. it's very processed and in your face and they that's what they that's what they're avoiding so when i set you up the main thing is i eliminate the compression even if it's mild it's like they want it raw leave the room tone on <laughs> you still have to do your high pass filter and if you know if your noise floor is high you still have to do a little noise reduction but after that you know if you're extra clicky you have to run your d clicker if you have that so my version of raw is different from what they're they're asking for like you record and then just send it just to me. send it right i say high pass filter normalize to minus three if you if you have a click a mouth noise uh problem run your declicker if you're if you're extra sibilant like because you have a 1a um run the deesser don't run the compressor normalize it to minus three send it out they're gonna they're gonna think it's fine don't change the, the don't replace uh, breaths. Don't lower the breaths unless they're very gaspy. Then you can just highlight them and bring down the volume. I think the other thing too, I mean, look, worst case scenario, if you save out a completely raw version, then worst case scenario, if you do something and the client decides that they don't like it, you can always send that one back. But I can honestly say that in the thousands of voiceovers that I've delivered with the minimal work that I do just cleaning it up you know what you've set me up with in Adobe I yeah. have never once had a client come back and say this is over processed or you've you know this isn't raw audio or or whatever artistically tasteful yeah we're just we're just cleaning it up just a, a little tiny bit and you know that's that's the bottom line on it here's a question from Roxanne what is an acceptable noise floor 
less than minus 60 is what the industry stand at. But let's get over this misconception. You start recording, you look at your meter. That's not your noise floor. I mean, yes, that's some representation of your noise floor. Your noise floor, or people turn down the input volume on their uh, interface thinking, oh, well, I'll turn the noise down. Okay, but you're turning everything down. It's called signal to noise ratio where your voice is the signal and the room tone is the noise and they go up and down by the same amount. So um, I like minus 72. Okay. <laughs> I, go cr I go crazy. So once you run the high pass filter and normalize to minus three, then look at your noise floor. The way we measure noise floor is when the file is normalized to minus three, not I go into record, I look at my meter because you could you could adjust your volume and make it, you could make it, oh, you want it less than minus 60? I'll just turn the input down. There, it's less than minus 60. That's not the way to do it. Do so. we obsess about this stuff more than we have to? Do you think, like things like, I see people talking about noise floor, like they're, like, I don't, I'm trying to think of what is an appropriate, uh, you know, way to, to describe what I'm, what I'm thinking right now, but I'm it's like, about my noise floor, like they're literally, there's, you know, hundreds of posts on Facebook of people talking about their noise floor. I could, I don't have a stinking clue what my noise floor is. I don't give a rip because once upon a time I set up my studio, I called you, I paid yep. you for two hours. You told me everything was good. And I just don't give a rip anymore, and I'm never going to think about it ever again unless I make no. some major change in my studio that that I need to think about it again. But we seem like we obsess over this. W well, what's that all about? Well, you have people that are living in a not ideal uh, situation. Oh, the next door neighbor's TV is on. Well, there's not a lot I can do about that. Um, you can't put a noise gate on or bang on the wall or anything. But people have HVAC outside their window. So yep. as I said, there are window inserts. When you put the high pass filter on, it will filter out low rumble. Mm -hmm. uh, if a truck passes by and you look in spectral, you'll be able to see it. You'll be able to take a little snippet of that and tell the noise reduction, hey, let's get rid of this. And then just highlight where you see the truck and you can get it out. Uh, especially uh, audio books, they're measuring. It's not so much an obsession. It, it, has, to, it has to be less than minus 60. But it's once it's waiting. set, it, like ideally, once your studio has been set up, if somebody's worked with you, for example, it's not something mm -hmm. that you should really have to think about ever again, unless something really changes. You know, they you it's know right, start right, building a new survey outside of your house, or yeah, you you get a new microphone, or you make a major change in your booth, or something like that. But ideally, yeah. to me, once it's set, it's set, and it's something that you really yeah. shouldn't have to worry about ever again. Or at least that's I guess that's how I think about it. But no, once we can get it less than minus 60 on the low deal. side of minus 60, minus right. 66, 68, you know, 72 is my favorite. Here's a here's a really good question from Katie. Is there a specific order to edit audio in? So is it high pass, normalize, and then declick? Does it matter? Should it be done a specific way? And if so, what is the specific way? The reason I do the high pass first is because one of the next steps is the noise reduction. So you te you teach adobe or audacity or any of the you know you teach it oh here's the noise let's minimize it but if you don't do the high pass filter first you're telling it hey let's get rid of this well this isn't even going to be there so let's filter out the really low rumble first that's not what we're telling noise reduction to get rid of we're telling it to get rid of what's left after the high pass filter so right. yeah high pass filter first normalize and then later, my order is declicker, deesser. Uh, sorry, declicker EQ if you need it. Right. Won't know if you need it until you send me a file. Declicker <laughs> EQ, <laughs> deesser. Don't know if you need it. And uh, isotope uh, RX standard. Don't have to get, say what number. As long as you've got standard, you've got the really good declicker and the really good deesser. Uh, and then a little bit of compression and then normalize to minus three. And that's the end of my chain. Okay. So yes. So yes, the order matters. The order does matter. Here's a question yeah. from Honey Badger. I'd love to know how to soften really harsh breaths. I know to leave some in it makes it sound more natural, more conversational, but how do you soften them? Is it something that you do just by manually reducing each one? Is there a plugin that you can use for this? What's the magic trick? 
there's a Waves plugin called Waves Deep Breather, but none of these really work. They think V's are, are breaths. They think F's are breaths. THs are breaths. So they're very tricky to adjust. And, you know, in audiobooks, it isn't just necessarily reducing the breath. Sometimes you have to adjust the pacing as well. So what I do, it's painstaking, but I highlight the breath and I press eight, which lowers it by eight dB or any number we set it up for. It's just highlight the breath and press a number and move on. I just wanted to throw your email up there just because people are asking, because you keep saying, send me a sample, send me a sample, send me a sample. So there's the, uh, there's the email address, by well, the let's way. let's tell them the criteria of the sample. Did you make a thing for, for that? I, I didn't, we, I thought we weren't okay. going to do it, but let's, okay. let's tell them the criteria for sending a sample. So if you want right. to send a audio sample to Uncle Roy, get a pen and paper, write this down. These are specific instructions for sending your audio sample to Uncle right. Roy. And, and if you don't do it, you know you know what happens. They wind up, I'm not going to listen to it. No, I do. Uh, record 10 seconds of room tone followed by a 30-second audition read all in one file. The, the pet peeve of mine is people say, here's my noise and here's my read. No, I want one file. And save it as your name underscore raw dot wave and email it to that email address there. If somebody set you up with a stack or you kind of know what you're doing to get it to be final, then save it again, your name underscore final dot wave and send me two files. That's fine. I'll leave the room tone on both. Because okay. even if you're cleaning up and, and finalizing the other version, I want to see what's left of and and don't just silence the room tone. I know we all know how to do that. That's not a, that's not a legit cleanup in, right. in, in my and especially for audiobooks, it's a no no. But uh, yeah, don't don't silence. Just leave it on there. I, I, you know, it's fine. okay. Right, Let's move right. on to the next question so we can get through everything. How important is the interface? Do we all need? Apollo twins. This is like the microphone question. Like everybody comparing their microphones. My microphone's better than yours. My my Apollo twins better than your Focusrite Scarlet Two I Two whatever. All the microphones plug into them exactly the same way. So what's the deal here? I'm even though you have a Focusrite product there. Um, the the older Two I Twos. If you're on a PC, which is another argument, another peer pressure thing. If you're on a PC and when PCs do an update, sometimes it corrupts the drivers of the Scarlet. So I'm not a big fan of Scarlet. They're fine. I have first generation Scarlet. That's been fine. It's never died. Uh, I'm a fan of Steinberg. You are 12 and you are 22. I bought the SSL two, which I think is very good. It, it's, it's a matter of, do you have enough gain for the microphone? Do you have enough headphone volume? A lot of these, I don't know why they're not they're. I think the SSL two has a better uh, uh, headphone preamp. This that was the one thing that always drove me nuts. I used a Scarlet for years, and and I got mocked a lot because I was using a Scarlet two i two with the U eighty seven and a four sixteen, and everybody's like, "You're an idiot! Like, why are you doing this?" And I'm like, "It sounds fine. That's why it sounds perfectly fine. Leave me alone!" Like, I don't need a ten thousand dollar interface when this two hundred dollar one sounds great. But that was the one thing that drove me nuts about it was that the headphone amp. In, in the right. Scarlet was was terrible. I you, still do have a Focusrite product now. I'm using their Pro Grade now, which is the the RedNet uh, audio over Ethernet, and so it's you know whatever. But that's just because that's the way my studio was set up. But right. but and at the end of the day, I was recording a U87 on a 2i2, and nobody knew the difference. Who's gonna know? You know. So not every you look. If you want all those bells and whistles, it's more shit to go wrong. Right. Uh, I'm good for you, Roxanne. That Solidarity. That's it. Just like you want to grow up and be like Mark when you grow up. That's great. <laughs> hey, if it if works, working, right? Yeah. If it's working, just leave it alone. Yes. That, if you want to put it up on your website, I've got an Apollo Twin or an Audient ID 4, 14, whatever. Uh, that's all fine. But that's status symbol. It doesn't not going to make your sound any better. And we just, just want to capture your voice. It just has to yeah. sound like you. 
And, and just to be clear, we're not knocking on the Apollo. I actually, that's one of the interfaces that I looked at when my when I was finally done with my my 2i2. It was one of the ones that I had thought about buying. I think the, the greater point here is you don't necessarily need to bankrupt yourself to get some of this equipment, particularly in the beginning, right? The 2i2 works fine. And so it becomes one of those things where you upgrade over time, right? I didn't always have a U87. I didn't always have a 416. I was working really hard at growing my business and then reinvesting back into it to upgrade microphone, to upgrade interface and all of that sort of stuff. And I think that's the greater point here. It's it's not, you know, you can't have an Apollo or, you know, we're, we're making fun of you if you've got an Apollo. It's if you can get it, great. But if you can't, you don't need it because some of these other, you know, the Steinberg, like you said, these $200, $300 interfaces work just fine. They all, it's kind of like DAWs, right? They all do the same thing at the end of the day. If you're just starting out, there's no reason, there's no need to buy a Studio Bricks, which we're going to get to in a minute. There's no need to buy an 87. There's no need to buy these you know, Manly and, and, and these other, you don't need. If you're just starting out, take that money and invest in coaching and invest in learning about marketing. Those right. are the biggest things you're going to need. Don't you right. know? A wave is a wave is a wave. As long as it sounds good, you can deliver clean audio. That's great. But learn your craft. Okay. So there you go. You don't have to have the fanciest interface. If you can afford it, you got the funds to do it. If you're ready to upgrade to it, yay, go for it. Have at her. But whoever has it, if they like it. Uh, yep. We're not saying, yeah, like yep. you said, we're not, we're not down on any of these things. No, you not get at all. Knock yourself out. All right. Next question. Let's go on here. Are there essential plugins that we should be asking Santa mm -hmm. for this Christmas? I know you, I, I will never forget. You came to my house pre-COVID. <laughs> it was like the last time I saw you almost. You came, you came to my house. You were in my and studio you buy and you're it. like, why don't you have isotope? And I'm like, I don't know. I didn't know I need it. You're like, you get isotope, buy it right now. And I'm going to set it up for you. And so there's actually pictures of you sitting at my desk where I'm sitting right now, installing isotope on my computer. Cause you told me I had to have it. And I will say that D clicker is worth every dime that i spent on it so tell us about some essential plugins that we need and maybe we can be watching for for special deals at christmas or whatever that goes in the yearbook those pictures you know for, mm -hmm. for later um so uh what's on sale is uh rx10 and i think there's a way to get it cheaper standard you know if you buy elements for 99 and then do the upgrade at 149 then you've paid 249 for the $300 or $400 list uh thing. Um yes, your yes, your your head is going to explode from all this. It's it's so funny because sometimes I think we do really 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 try hard to overcomplicate it. And so it's nice to have somebody like you who's here just saying, "Look, you just get this, get this, get this. You're just good to go." Bypass filter and normalize to minus 3. I can't make it any simpler than that. <laughs> Or take my class and we'll really complicate things. All right. Um, I didn't mean to throw you off your train. So we're talking plugins. Let's go back to plugins. Right. So, so uh, RX 10. Now, if you have RX standard, like what, I don't know which one you have seven or eight, whatever, whatever you have, if you what have standard, have? that's a good question. When, if you have standard, you have the good declicker. You don't need to upgrade to 10. The, the difference that I know about in 10 is the D clicker works faster. So if you're doing long audiobook channel uh, chapters that are 20 minutes long and you, you pushed your D clicker and it's chugging along for six minutes, uh, it'll go quicker with 10. That is so the one part. thing that I would like minus minus seven. I've got version seven and it is okay. dang slow. If yeah. it's slow, uh, 149 bucks from any paid isotope product, uh, if you can't find it on the isotope website, just go to Sweetwater and type in, uh, RX 10 cross grade, uh, and it's a cross grade from any paid product. So as long as you don't have a crack copy of elements or something, okay. if you have elements, that's it, that, you know, elements used to sell for 29 bucks and the 49 bucks really cheap. Now elements is 99 bucks. Everything's going up. So uh, 149, I believe, is the current upgrade price. Get it? Yes, if I've set you up. Yes, I have to go in there and change your Make a few tweaks. Yep. And then if you have a magic seven button, yes, I have to redo your magic seven uh, because it's got new. It's got new plugins. Uh, you know, 
with better functionality. So, but the three, there's a lot of tools in there that you can play with. Somebody, somebody ran, somebody bought, you don't need advanced. Okay. Somebody said advanced was the same price. They bought advanced and then they sent me a file and I said, well, you silenced all your room tone. I, you can't, that's no good. Oh, I, I ran dialogue isolator on it. And so, yeah, all you had was the dialogue and it cut out everything. Well, that's great, but that's that doesn't sound natural to me, and especially if you're doing audiobooks. So the D D clicker, the D, mouth noise D clicker. Yep. Uh, the D esser. There's also a D clipper in case you accidentally overload your mic preamp, and when right. you look at it, it's square. Yep. Uh, when you highlight it and press com comma button on my in my world, um, it'll turn it back into a sine wave. Okay. So. Somebody sent me an, an entire audiobook. My wife did an audiobook and uh and everything was off, was off the oh, scale. Dang. And I ran the D clipper on it. I saved the whole book. She was going to have to re-record the whole book. That's amazing. I saved the day. So there you go. So if you so you can get away with 7 or 8 for now if you want faster if you have standard, speed than if, no, you, have if you have standard. standard. Yes. If you have you, standard you can get away. If you have any element if you have elements Go get the upgrade and then Go get the upgrade. Me. But if you want more speed out of the processing on these, then then the upgrade to ten would be worth it. Yeah. And so watch for a deal, which I'm sure you'll be able to find a deal over the another course of good write off. Yep. Yes. All right, yep. moving on. We we've talked a lot about microphones and interfaces and and more in a general sense. Give us a couple of recommended setups. If you're if you're a beginner who's getting started out and you're you need a microphone and an interface and you you don't have a ton of money to spend. And if you're a pro who maybe you've used your 2i2, but you're ready to upgrade, what, what are you thinking? So, and most people know this is uh, this is what I preach. Uh, the Rode NT1, not the 1A. Uh, MXL CR89 is also a good beginner mic. Uh, even the AT2035. And I used to be a fan of the Stellar X2. It's a little too bright and sometimes noisy, hissy. So to forget that, cross that off the list. And the CAD, CAD E100SX. Those are my starter mics. Uh, you can get a Scarlet Solo. It's fine. A Steinberg UR12 if you only need one channel, or a Steinberg UR22 if you actually need two channels. Uh, the SSL2 is one of my new favorites, uh, and those are those interfaces. The 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 Solo and the Steinberg they're 115 dollars. They're not it's not expensive. And then yes, obviously you need an XLR mic cable to go with it, and a mic stand. Pop filters come with the uh, the road. Is it worth it to spend a little bit of money, a little bit extra money on your microphone cable? Not in my experience, but I'm sure theoretical. And if you actually could measure noise, yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, how many times are you gonna buy a mic cable? So you might as well buy a good don't one. Don't necessarily get Amazon's choice, right? You know. Ten dollar microphone cable. That's so spend thirty dollars on a mic cable. You only need you only need one. Yep. If you have one microphone. So yeah, I mean Megami, and used to be Monster cables. Um, I yeah. see people talk about the Megami cables all the time, and just wonder if you know is it actually worth it? Does it actually make a difference? And and you know is that something that you want to spend a little bit of extra on? But so we've got the the NT1. You, you mentioned the Steinberg. I know you're a big fan of the Steinberg. The 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 Focusrite will work now. If we're looking to upgrade, maybe we've been at it well a while. We're making a little bit of money. We want to make our studio a little more sexy. You know, we maybe we want to get a little bit more appeal from the agents or you know certain agents right. that we're trying to land. Uh, what looks good on a on a spec sheet that that might catch their eye. I'm sure there are plenty of other choices. I'm a big fan of the Neumann 102, not the 103. The 103 is peer pressure. The 103 is, uh, the, my description of the 103 is it's dark and sibilant all at the same time. Okay. Uh, so I'm not a fan of that sound. I think George also agrees that that's not our favorite. 
I say the 102 is like a baby baby 87. The 102 is uh, 850 with the shock mount list. So that's, you know, a couple of up. Um, you can Obviously find it on Reverb. <laughs> yeah, it's coming. Uh, Reverb, you can find some good gently used uh, yep. microphones. A Reverb and Vintage King can look into those two uh, places. I know Patrick is really looking for that used 87. Um, as much as the Neumann guy would have loved to have sold him one over there at Mavo. Sure. Uh, you, you can just, you know, be patient and look. I found my 87. I went on Facebook Marketplace and found a, a studio in Brooklyn downsizing because, let's face it, rap groups don't need an 87, I don't think. Yep. So they sold me this four-month-old still in the box i don't think they ever used it i got it for, i could sell it tomorrow for 3500 i got it for two grand nice so if, if you shop and it's that's what lives in my booth now just like you i want to be like mark when i grow up you now know? might be a good time you know wait wait a couple more weeks and then all the voice actors that are getting new equipment for christmas santa claus is bringing in new equipment and then they're looking to unload some of their old stuff it might be a good opportunity to find a good deal on stuff Here's something we haven't talked about. I know we're getting, I know we're running eight o'clock here, but uh, there is one That's question fine. that has been asked a lot about headphones. Any recommendations for good headphones? <laughs> so I'll tell, I'll try to tell the short story of these headphones. These are Neumann. These are expensive headphones and they're heavy, you know, but I have to endorse because Cliff and I were at Vio Atlanta. His headphones broke. He went to the Neumann Sennheiser booth, tried these on, whipped out his credit card. And the long story short is Neumann gifted uh, Cliff and Bev and I these headphones. Wow. But they're 500, they're 500 bucks. They're great. I love them. I told them I would retire my, my really my favorite, but don't tell Sennheiser, is the um, Biodynamic uh, DT 770 Pro 80 ohm that everybody with the gray with the gray uh, cups with the gray foam. Yep, everybody loves those. Yep, uh, I I they're at Donna's house, so uh, when I'm there, I'm happy. I'm wearing those headphones. Uh, when I'm here, I have to wear my Neumanns for on camera. Uh, <laughs> and I know you're a big fan of your AT whatever it was the orange ones the, the I, akgs that i can't even tell you what they are but i literally just bought them because they were orange and and actually they do sound really great the what are they like the mtx 50s or something 50. like that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. mtx they're, 50 the akg i think that's what it is they're good they're very efficient meaning they're a little bit louder than some of the other headphones but they're also a little bit brighter and i bought one because John from Long Island Voiceover Takeover, he didn't like the biodynamics. They, they hurt his ears, so he tried these these um, the ones that you bought, the fifties. So I bought one, and I said I put it in up there, and I said brighter isn't necessarily better. And Ann Ganguza wrote me, "I'm sorry you don't like my headphones." <laughs> I, I stand corrected. They are Audio Technica MX50. I had to look it up because I literally bought them because they were orange. And I was like, I don't even know what they are. I obviously didn't need them. I had oh, just they, actually they not that. They come in turquoise, yeah, and purple. A bunch of different and, colors. I, I, I hadn't fun. bought, I just bought a pair of Sennheisers not all that long ago. But then these ones came out and I was like, yeah, I'm a sucker. I right? wouldn't they're, they're necessarily, orange. you know, if you're going to judge the actual recording quality if you're playing with eq or anything i wouldn't necessarily trust those because they're a little bright so if they're bright you're not gonna your hand isn't gonna go to try and brighten it it's already bright right uh they're not flat like i i think the biodynamics are flat i think these neumanns are pretty flat they're really these are really good and it's really strange because the cord is on the right side and i don't we ha we don't know why it's that would actually up. be really convenient for my current studio setup. So maybe I'm going to have to go out and buy a pair of those just for the, the convenience factor of it. 
Maybe. All right, I want to I want to respect your time because I know you've got another session coming up here. But we we had one more question that that Terry, I wanted to put Terry up. Is our, Terry is probably he's he's uh, he's watching. He's he'll be he's fine. But so you know, if we're five minutes late, it's okay. You know, we we've covered a lot of ground, microphones, interfaces. We've talked a little bit about treatment. You know, in a perfect world, we would all be able to go out and buy a studio bricks and have that studio bricks set up. I still remember the first time I recorded in your whisper room, and I was like, I gotta get me one of these, but. That's not necessarily realistic for everybody. So are there little things that we can do that can improve our space, whether we are recording in a closet or a pillow fort or a spare room or whatever? Bear There's Cave little... Silent Booth. Yes, this is a Canadian company I met at VO North. And I then they also brought a booth down to Mavo. And I think they'll be at other conferences. Uh, the, the, they... I think what they did is it's a husband and wife. She's a singer, honey, build me a booth. So he looked at a whisper room and he did everything he could to take away all the stuff that we hate about whisper rooms. Right. So, um, it looks like a whisper room, but it's quiet, like a studio bricks Okay. and the air handler is silent. And I really, they're, they're good people. They may drive one down, I'm trying to talk them into uh, I'm trying to talk them into bringing me a booth and saying, you know, 150 people are going to be here in in September end of September. You know, we just had 100 about. plus people watching as you as you promoted it live on this webinar. So that should count for something, right? These are these are really well built. The guy comes out, the guy he put it together with a drill in, in 45 minutes. It was nothing. Zzz, 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 and it was all put together. And yeah. you can have treatment, a double wall, double wall without treatment, because I have treatment, double wall without treatment, but with the air handler is like 5,500 US. That's cheap. Comparatively so, speaking, yeah, it is. Four, four by four. Yep. Delivered. Delivered. Yep. As, uh, uh, you know, I don't know. And and they're, you know, they'll drive it down from Canada, come here, put it to, if I can sell my whisper, anybody want to buy whisper room four by four? <laughs> if I sell that. Then I'll have room for my bear cave booth. So look, not everybody needs a bear cave booth. Not everybody needs studio bricks, but those are really quiet. If you're in a noisy environment, you're on a trafficy road or uh, in a flight pattern. Yep. You need a double wall, either either studio bricks or or uh, where the kids are out playing and yelling and screaming. Uh, I know Christy Harst has one. She likes hers. Yep. Um, but if you're in a quiet neighborhood, do your PVC. You don't need more than that. I it mean, works. Yeah. This is this is a thing that I love, right? Because okay, we're talking about these these bear cave booths, which are you know I you you and I have talked about them. They're beautiful. I love it. The studio bricks, amazing. The whisper room, amazing. But in a couple of months, seven hundred voice actors are going to be at Vo Atlanta, and. Yep. 698 of us are going to be posting pictures on social media of our pillow forts that we've built at the Hilton Atlanta airport. And so while we're at home recording with our U87s in our studio bricks booths, we're doing the exact same voiceover jobs in a hotel room on a portable travel rig under a pillow fort. And our clients can't tell the difference, which just goes to show you don't necessarily need to spend a lot of money. You have to have good sound but it doesn't specifically require some of these really expensive upgrades. And if it's just an audition, the client can be, you know, more forgiving and say, yep. look, I'm at a hotel, you know, they just judge the read. And then yep. if you hire me, great. I'll find a studio or yep. wait till I get home. Yep. And then here's a little plug for the tri booth because that's another. Portable. That's the one I want. We need to yep. sign a petition and get me one of those. You get your bear cave. Sure, I want the tri booth. Watching- it's not, you know, it's Tuesday night. It's not like George is on uh, VOBS right now. That's right. Maybe, so we, we need watch. to work it out. So we, we've we've done the plugs now. You get your bear cave. I get my tri booth. Everybody walks away happy for Christmas. That's that's George, all. George, uh, <laughs> George Whittem and, and Rick Wasserman created this tri booth thing, which is very cool. It's got a little yep. shelf. It's got a light in there, I think. And, yep. it, you know, it, it folds up and, and you travel with it. And you put it in your hotel room. You put yep. it at your mother-in-law's house. Yeah. 
Yep. Santa's hoping. Nice. I'm, 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 I'm hoping Santa's bringing me one of those things for Christmas because I would love to be able to take that and leave it at my mother-in-law's and be able to record whenever I'm up there. So George told me that if you go on Instagram, you can get 250 off or something like that. It's I think it's list 1500, but you can get it for 1250. Or if you know George, you know, if you have some blackmail pictures of George, <laughs> I have some karaoke blackmail. Maybe I can get a free booth out of him or something. All right, I know you got to go. Terry's Terry's patiently waiting for his session, Bye. but let's let's quickly uh, let's quickly talk about this. You've you've heard us mention it a few times throughout the life changing setup, which is basically Uncle Roy comes into your universe, takes over your computer, and spends two hours making your DAW, Adobe Audition, Audacity, or Twisted Wave just run better and more efficient, and making you a better and more efficient editor. This was one of the best investments that I have ever personally made for my voiceover business. And I thought that I was a really good editor. And, and I learned so much from this, this two-hour session. So this is the, the two-hour session. If you're interested, 350 for the two hours. The, the email address is there, antlandprods at AOL.com. You are not going to regret signing up for this. You are not going to regret the experience. You know, if you wait till the 24th, you could possibly win. You, you could possibly spot. win one. That's right. You could possibly win one on the 12 voiceover gifts of Christmas because one of those will be given away. But right. And the other and the other one hour sessions, you could apply towards the two hour and this way you get it half price. Yeah, absolutely. That could be the other option as well. So if you haven't signed up yet for the 12 voiceover gifts of Christmas, make sure that you head to the website markscottcoaching.com forward slash 12 VO gifts and, and get your name into the draw for that one. Uh, we're, we're, I, I announced uncle Roy's prizes today. He was day one. This is a big part of the kickoff of the, of the contest. Uh, the, the, it will all culminate with a live stream again, right here on my YouTube channel. So please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Can't we're going to do that on the 24th. I can't wait to see boo pulling those names, pulling out, of the the names out of the Santa stocking. That's right. Well, uh, uncle Roy, I want to say thank you so much for the time that you've given us. I hit the button again. See, I got, I got, I touched the mouse. I, <laughs> I I'm want to thank you for software. I'm playing with the software. Now, for those of you that were wondering, there, there are a few people that had asked. I'm going to mention it. Yes, this video is going to exist on my YouTube channel. Um, uh, you will be able to go back and watch it. If you come back tomorrow, if you missed the beginning part or you, you know, this you came in late. You got to pay me a little extra. I don't know. Well, we better we better. Uh, maybe we'll put in uh, one more plug for the uh, life changing here. Let's just oh, bring no, that. This okay. is Uncle Roy's payment in perpetuity for the. Uh, <laughs> For the uh, the fact that this is going to live on on my YouTube channel forever, but also guys, the email address antlandprods at aol.com. You want to check that one out so that you can send those studio samples in. Uh, one more time, give us the instructions for the studio samples. Ten seconds of room tone followed by a thirty second audition read. Please don't send me. Hi, Uncle Roy. This is me talking into my microphone. I didn't have a script. Don't send me that. That doesn't tell me what your voice sounds like when you're reading in your space. And that's the whole point. 10 seconds of room tone, a 30 second audition, read all in one, save as your name underscore raw dot wave. If you know, or if somebody set you up with a stack or you know what you're doing in post and you want me to evaluate that, that's fine. Then your name underscore final dot, uh, dot wave and email to antlandprods at shamefully at aol.com. Antlandprods oh, at AOL.com. That's the email address. Get those samples sent in. Again, Uncle Roy, thank you so much for your time. I love that you have jingle bells. I got to get some jingle bells. Why don't I have these jingle are the, bells? These are the expensive, the real They're ones. They're like the real ones. I got to get some of those for the uh, for the 12 voiceover gifts of Christmas for the live stream on the 24th. I'm going to have to. Oh, I'll be a, on there. I'll just have to be your bell ringer. That's there's, all. There's an antique store like two minutes down the road from my house. I'm going to have to go check it out, see if I can find some, but thank you so much for this guys. Every thank you everyone for coming and watching. And hopefully you've learned a few things and this has Who's been very tomorrow? helpful for you. Who's on tomorrow. Uh, well, I, the next thing I've got the, uh, tomorrow for the 12 voiceover gifts of Christmas, honestly, I can't even remember. Uh, Tom Pinto, oh. I believe is, is uh, oh. tomorrow for the 12 voiceover gifts of Christmas king of in show narration. And then uh, the next big thing that I'm going to be doing on my YouTube channel is actually going to be on Friday for free advice Friday. And that is going to be live with Everett Oliver. Uh, so uh, he is going to speak his truth about the voiceover industry, which could be very, very interesting. So you're going to want to check that out. That's going to be Friday afternoon at one o'clock Eastern time. And that will be streaming live here, but uncle Roy, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for all the information that you shared and 
Thank you to everyone who came and watched, and I, I hope you learned a few things. Have a very, very good night. See you Friday.